Okay, let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everybody, good morning, and thank you for joining us today for addressing the driver shortage, key ways to win in the Uber competitive labor market. I'm here today with Delivery Drivers Incorporated, Swan Insurance, and of course, Field Logics. My name is Tammy Strand. I'm the Director of Marketing at Field Logics. I have the honor of being your host today. Okay, so now, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. I'll begin with, oops, sorry. Um, I'll begin with Aaron. Um, today we have Aaron Hagman, CEO of Delivery Drivers Incorporated. Aaron is also the founder of DDI, which was born out of his frustration as a 1099 freelance driver. DDI is a third-party human resources and driver management firm that has connected over 120,000 third-party delivery drivers to gigs. Welcome, Aaron, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Tammy. I'm excited to be here. Cool. Also joining us today is the CEO of SWAN Insurance, and SWAN stands for Sleep Well at Night, Chris Smallberg. Chris has been working with the transportation industry for over 10 years, helping new and experienced business owners with their transportation insurance. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Tammy. Finally, we have Yukon Palmer, CEO and founder of Field Logics. Yukon has spent 20 years in the fleet management industry and has led Field Logics to win several awards for innovation, including the IoT Breakthrough Award and the A List in IoT Award. And I can attest personally, working for Yukon, that he, he definitely has a thirst for innovation. So, welcome, Yukon. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, so thanks again to the panel for coming and thank you audience for coming. As you can see, we have a diverse group of experts for this panel and they are all hearing a common theme among their customers and prospects. It's becoming more and more difficult to hire qualified drivers. As a matter of fact, data in a recent report from the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics states that the number of job openings reached over 10 million in June. And right now, there are more open jobs than there are people to fill them. Which leads me to my first question, and I'll start with Aaron, since this directly applies to you. Where does one begin? What, you know, what is the best way to find qualified drivers today? Yeah, let's jump right into <laughs> details of the conversation. I mean, one of the things we do at DDI as a third-party partner is helping with the onboarding piece, the accounting, and the risk management. So if we're digging into onboarding, I want to offer our audience a few specific things uh, that we're considering when we're looking at actually like how are we finding drivers. Recruiting is what we do. Number one. Uh, really, it, these days, and to heading into 2022, more than ever, it takes a full-time effort. Yeah. Really, we, we can't dedicate 20% of one of our manager's times to going out and running ads and following up with people. It is a very competitive market, and it, it takes more effort than ever to track and measure and you know manage the performance and expenses around this process of finding drivers. Yeah. You got to go fishing and you got to catch them when they're there. Um, the second thing we think about when we're really digging into, you know, how are we finding drivers is it takes a mix these days, 2021, 2022, I think, of digital and traditional mm -hmm. recruiting efforts. So while you have to think as an advanced digital marketer, you know, running online ads mm -hmm. and getting impressions and conversions, you also also need to be looking at your local penny savers and local newspapers and towns and some of those traditional sort of print advertising methodologies. Uh, very important. And the last quick thought to get our brains going for today when we're talking about recruiting drivers is technology, is we really need to look at two words, automation and integration. How are our systems working here in terms of technology and tools? And I know we have some great uh, panelists here going to talk about that today to tracking the data and driving that forward. Um, you know, if you can move a driver candidate along without having to push a button when their background checks are clear, for example, it's going to be a strategic significant advantage to getting them on the road. Yeah. Wow. That sounds an awful lot like marketing. <laughs> um, um, okay. So thanks, Aaron. Um, and speaking of tools and technology, how, how does FieldLogic help our customers solve this problem of finding the best drivers? 
Yeah. So when it comes to finding drivers, you know, I, I say that it's, it's really like selling your product. You know, you have to market mm-hmm. your product. You have to identify your target customers. Um, and it's, it's not any different from that. So uh, what I would suggest for any company is to find uh, their favorite source uh, for candidates. So this might be local schools, trade schools, you know, um, universities, um, you know, K through 12 schools, things like that. Um, and start recruiting from those sources. And then also uh, job boards, um, just like Aaron mentioned, uh, maybe digital marketing. So some sort of digital uh, resources that you can market through. Um, do that to find uh, these qualified candidates. And then um, as you're, you've identified these sources, you really want to craft your job description in a way that's appealing to a lot of these potential candidates. So that would entail highlighting the company culture so what sets your culture apart from other companies that they could potentially go work for? Yep. Uh, describe the technical tools they use. You know, a lot of these employees or these candidates, when they work for a company, they want to work for a company that provides them with tools to help make them more productive. And, um, you know, they, they'll shy away from companies that are using old pen and paper uh, uh, processes. Uh, so tools, you know, to, we, we help companies by providing tools such as route optimization and dispatching. We allow the drivers to send ETAs to their clients when they're en route, uh, capture documentation after the work is completed um, to really help ensure that they're more productive, they're, they're not getting lost when they're uh, heading toward their jobs. And they're also providing their clients with uh, great evidence that you know, the work was completed uh, in the mm-hmm. manner it was supposed to be completed in. So describing those tools and then also describing rewards and incentives. Uh, you know, maybe there's certain programs that can be put in place to reward the top performing drivers and, and put that in the job description um, to, mm-hmm. to basically get the point across that, you know, not only do you have a more effective or efficient way for them to do their jobs, but also you do reward the people that do perform. Yes, absolutely. Yep. So Chris, what, what have you been seeing in the insurance industry? What's working for, for your customers? Well, I think what we see a lot is not necessarily the best way to find qualified drivers. Sometimes we Mm -hmm. see the way not to do it is that people are frantically rushing to get drivers, whether they have (laughs) people quit or whether they've had a demand from a customer to flex up their fleet. We're getting people uh, or our clients that are trying to put drivers in those seats as quickly as possible. And what what happens is they are putting unqualified drivers mm-hmm. or maybe drivers that are ineligible or that wouldn't really fit for their insurance and then calling us. So that mm-hmm. because they're in such a rush, they might call us and say, hey, can you check out this driver? And maybe that driver has a DUI and we tell them, you know, they're not gonna be insured. And the client says, well, he's already driving. He's already driving right now. So mm-hmm. we get these situations mm-hmm. where it takes preparation what Aaron said, it's a daily process of having drivers, having relationships with drivers and having a pool to choose from. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think the, the main thing is to be prepared and instead of reacting to a new mm. situation, being proactive. Think about when your drivers leave, or is there, um, can, you leave, can they leave on a better relationship where you can call them if it's a, you know, an emergency and you need mm-hmm. help. Um, those type of scenarios, I think, are really important to think about and, and just be prepared for. Yeah, I like that. I like to be proactive rather than reactive. I like that. All right, so let's go to the next question that I have for you guys. Um, okay, so you Yukon mentioned tools, which is also like, you know, something to help the drivers and especially the 1099 side get more done, make more money, but how can you leverage, how can you really maximize any tools that, that you have in place to retain those drivers? Aaron? Oh, gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you uh, alluded to 1099s uh, on there, and that's really what we do at Delivery Drivers Inc. is we work with a nationwide network of independent contractor, professional 1099 mm-hmm. drivers. So to this question of retention to a 1099 workforce, 
what we really think about a DDI is the driver lens. What's their point of view? And our goal is to close the gap between what we often have available at as W-2, traditional employees, if you will, to contract employees and contract drivers. Uh, so three categories come to mind, making sure that our driver network at DDI has access to a robust suite of automotive products uh, that they would have, you know, whether it's commercial insurance for themselves or roadside assistance programs, things that you need as a professional driver really help, you know, round out that suite to, you know, making it a good experience as a worker. The second thing, on here, and probably maybe the most important we find a DDI to the drivers out there is their personal benefits picture, mm. medical, dental, yes. vision, um, life insurance, but even down into, we often like to cite pet insurance programs that we have at <laughs> DDI. You know, these are programs that, again, an employee workforce, you may have access to through your HR team, but DDI essentially acts as the HR partner for our driver network in the sense of <laughs> making sure they have access to this. It really has statistically proven to help retention. And last but not least, depending upon the nature of our various driver workforces out there in our audience today, there's an entire professional set of, uh, in, you know, kind of risk and products that we think about for the 1099 drivers. Uh, and again, I'm sure Chris can tell us more about, you know, insurance and auto insurance and some of those things, cargo, liability and risk. Uh, but even having vehicle and fleet resources for the drivers uh, on here are, are really good programs. When you find that you have a robust sort of suite of products mm -hmm. and for the driver workforce, right, 1099 workforce, you know, everybody starts to find something they really like and you're going to see your retention behind this group improve. Yeah, for sure. So that, that you, you mentioned, you know, fleet management tools. So Yukon, how can you explain to the audience how our tools at field logic help companies retain their drivers? Yeah. So, you know, with, with the tools, one of the things that it's, in, that's important for companies to do is to, um, you know, discuss the benefits or, or, you know, educate the drivers about the benefits of the technology to them. Um, so some of the ways we help is we help them ensure that they're completing more jobs throughout the day. Um, they're getting to jobs on time. Uh, the drivers are, uh, they operate the vehicles uh, in a safe, in a safe manner uh, to ensure that there's less likelihood that they might be in an accident. Um, also client communications where they're able to send ETAs out, as I previously mentioned, um, to their waiting clients. Um, so with our technology, there's a lot of benefits to the drivers and it is important for the company to express those benefits to the driver, particularly when they roll it out. Um, also, it's important for these companies to put together proper use policies. So mm -hmm. nowadays they're capturing more data than you know ever. And uh, a lot of times these drivers don't quite know what happens with this data once it's collected. And there are a lot of privacy concerns. There's actually a pretty big article right now about uh, Amazon and, and their role, recent rollout of uh, in, in vehicle cameras and how they're getting employee pushback. Um, oftentimes it's because the drivers don't quite know where this data is going, who's using it, how's it how it's mm -hmm. going to be used. So it is important for a company to put together a proper use policy you know, what data is going to be collected, how that data is going to be used, what might be considered an infraction, what might be rewarded. Um, all that needs to be transparent to the drivers uh, to ensure that, you know, everyone's on the same page in, in regards to the data that's collected and how it's being used. Also, when these tools are implemented, there needs to be proper training. So you can't just throw the tool at the employee and say, okay, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. These employees need to be uh, trained on the, the best way to use the technology and, and you know, how it's supposed to be used and, and, and all those things to ensure that they're using, using it to its, um, to its you know, the, the highest potential. Um, also, it's important to set goals. You know, we collect a lot of data. A lot of that data can be used to reward the drivers. Uh, this data should be used to, to basically compare their performance to a goal and reward those drivers and you know, be periodically checked upon on a monthly or quarterly basis to see how these drivers are advancing to their goals. Um, and you know, if they put together a program where they reward drivers either through some sort of financial incentive, you know, sometimes it's just perks. It's giving them a new vehicle or a new phone um, the next time they re you know, cycle out an old vehicle or, or phone. Um, those little things make all the difference. Yeah. Um, so it is really important for these companies to basically 
use this data for something positive within the organization yeah, through these goals. Definitely. Or, or and I like the transparency aspect you, you brought up as well. That's very important, mm -hmm. especially today. Okay, so Chris, last but not least for this one, um, from your point of view, from the insurance standpoint, what have you been seeing business owners do um, or leveraging to retain their top drivers? Well, I think the business owners realize it's a very, it's competitive out there that drivers mm -hmm. can apply for another job in a matter of minutes and <laughs> online. They can also take the option of starting their own company, their own DOT, or get their own authority and try to run it on their own. Mm -hmm. um, so they have to have something that appeals to the drivers. Uh, they need to, I mean, there's only so much you can do as far as paying a driver. Um, you have to pay for gas. Everybody's paying for the vehicles. So I think what sets apart certain companies that have better retention is uh, the ones that have a good relationship with the drivers, um, good mm -hmm. communication with the drivers, and are explaining why they're doing certain things or providing training, like Yukon mentioned, that if, if you're putting cameras into the vehicles, explain why, explain how it may be able to help them. For example, if one of those drivers gets in an accident and they're at fault, or they're determined to be at fault, the camera can prove maybe they weren't at fault. And not, not only does that help the company, but that person, that individual driver is not gonna have their personal insurance go up because they had an accident on the road where they were at fault. So that camera may be able to help them personally um, along with help the company. So yeah. little things like that where you change the perspective of the driver yeah. and build it into a way, build the relationship into a way that you, know, you show you care about the driver because we see a lot of companies, especially as they grow super fast, they, they just need drivers and they, they start losing some of the personal touches that, that we all like and that we all gravitate to. So those are things to keep in mind. Uh, I think the relationship makes a big difference and having a driver stay for a, lo a longer period is great for safety as well because yeah. when we look at it from an insurance standpoint, the more experience somebody has, uh, running certain routes or running certain vehicles, the less likely they are to get in an accident. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that this is a perfect segue to our next question because, you know, I really do think that's correct, Chris. It's, it's so competitive out there that you've got to keep those drivers engaged with your brand and keep them, you know, top of, have you top of mind. Um, and, you know, because you don't want them to leave, you don't want to invest the time and the money to get them on board. And then all of a sudden, poof, they're gone. <laughs> um, so Aaron, can you tell us what, what some of the most successful companies today are doing to keep their drivers engaged with their brand? And how important do you think this is? I love the last part of this question, because I believe that in the three pieces of the puzzle we've talked about today, from recruiting to retention to now engagement, this is the it's as important a piece as the former, you know, the first two, but it's not discussed enough. Right, so right. Really, it is a perfect segue from what the guys were just saying on here. As Chris talks about communication and Yukon alludes to transparency, the first thing we think about that, you know, we often help the companies do, but that our most successful clients uh, when it comes to engagement are doing is regular systemic communication. Mm -hmm. We all know about you and using the tools out there, the technology to track it. So collecting net promoter scores, but engaging newer technologies to micro pulse drivers, get regular mm -hmm. communications. How was that experience? Rate today's earnings, et cetera. You know, it's all about engagement, communicating with the workforce, asking them and taking action on what they want. Mm -hmm. Now, from some of our surveys at DDI this year, we have found, and we're really leaning uh, into engagement strategies around educational technology, ed tech, we would say, um, and engaging in the conversations that matter to our driver audience. And, and again, in DDI's case, specifically a 1099 driver audience. And the conversations really touch on many of the things that we've started to talk about here today. So uh, having modules, certifications, and, you know, really uh, advanced education uh, opportunities for drivers around risk, 
insurance, taxes, you know, their mm. financial implications yeah. of what does it mean to be a 1099 driver these days in this ever shifting game? If you're in California or Massachusetts, the state's rules are changing underneath us, for example, as a driver. And they need to be, because they're more aware than ever, they need to be up to speed on these things. Uh, we've talked about safety, probably one of the number one concerns. And what right. we've started to see is if you talk to your driver workforce, and I really push the audience today to do so, is what safety means to the driver is very different than what we often think about that safety means to us as business owners, right? You know, it becomes a different, more pragmatic concern. And last, again, entrepreneurialism. You know, we really love the independence and leaning into this. And drivers say, you know, I think Chris just mentioned, you know, get your DOT certification, start your own business, you know, hire a subcontractor or three of your own. How, how do I do this? How do I get started? These are really great engagement conversations with mm -hmm community yeah and last thing i would offer for us to to consider today for food for thought for this is you know uh sort of counterintuitive perhaps i realize it as, as i say it but in a 1099 workforce the most engaged drivers are often working on other platforms it's just the truth they're hustling right. They're working yeah. as many hours as they can. They're following the money. They're looking at the data from Yukon and the field logistics <laughs> platform. And they're going, where can I go to work on here? So I really would consider that we have conversations and look into the strategy around leaning into the 1099 game. Um, and it's something we're always trying to do at DDI is find our driver networks, even at, especially active drivers, more opportunities in and around their current gigs. The 10, 15% of our workforce that picks up a side hustle, they, they make it a little money. They're going to stick around doing our jobs as well. Um, so it, it's a strategy to consider. And really, if we're measuring engagement separate from retention, you're going to find engaged drivers are, are these drivers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And if they're, you know, you make it easier for them to, to have that side hustle, they're more likely to stick around, you know. Exactly. All right, so Yukon, what have you seen our customers do to keep their, their workforce or their drivers engaged? Yeah, so, so really to tack on to what uh, Aaron just said, um, you know, it, it all comes down to engagement. Um, you know, we have to keep in mind that things have, have been very fluid over the past 18 months. Um, and a lot of these employees are, are completely remote now. So they may still um, be a, a mobile workforce as they were prior, but now they have less uh, interaction, less physical interaction with people in the office. So because of that, they're kind of detached, kind of disengaged from the company, from the, you know, the mm -hmm. goings on in, within the company itself. Um, so sometimes it's pretty easy for people like that to just leave and go somewhere else mm -hmm. because they just don't feel as committed to the organization since they're not interacting with the people on a normal basis. So you know, what we've seen is a lot of companies will use new tools to still maintain a level of communication. They just may do it differently. You know, that's why you see companies like Zoom and Slack um, and Teams, all these products really taking off because people want to ensure that their employees remain engaged and they're leveraging technology to make that happen. Um, and, you know, by the way, that's one of the things that we offer is yeah. a certain level of communication and engagement through our system. Um, the other thing too is uh, companies have to be somewhat empathetic. You know, they, mm -hmm. they have to, let their employees know they understand what's going on. You know, you're going to have a lot of employees that maybe just kind of burn out because of everything that's been going on over the past right. year and a half, not just company wise, but personally and societally and, and all those things. So, you know, th these companies have to have a certain level of empathy uh, with these employees and, and let them know they understand what's going on and they're, they're willing to work with them. You know, these, these employees, their lives have been upended, not just due to COVID, but some of the, results of COVID, you know, maybe their, their kids were, have been um, schooling or homeschooling essentially for the past uh, year and mm -hmm. a half. They have sick family members that have come down with COVID. They have uh, people that are more susceptible to, uh, to getting sick that they have to look out for. So, um, you know, these companies have to understand that, or, they, you know, and the successful ones do, that they have to have that empathy, but they also have to have some flexibility to allow these employees to take care of things that are going on in their personal lives um, and if, if they do that, they, you know, they build a certain amount of goodwill with the employees. Um, and then also the other thing is, is, you know, a lot of our customers, their employees are all, they've all been deemed essential workers. 
So they've been on the front line since, mm. since this thing started. So regardless of what's going on in their lives, you know, in their circle, you know, they still had to go out and, and do their work every day. And, um, you know, our companies, the ones that are doing well, um, mm-hmm. they show appreciation for these employees. You know, th- these, these employees, a lot of times feel like they're being taken for granted because, you know, they didn't get the, they don't have the privilege of working from home like a lot of other people do. Uh, but the companies that acknowledge that and appreciate their employees, you know, they're doing very well on the retention side. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I know yeah, that they've been keeping the world running <laughs> yeah. while, while we've been hiding. So, um, Chris, what about you? What do you see from your um, insurance lens, um, your customers doing to um, ha- have their drivers engage with their brand? Well, I would say one of the things that I, I notice is that when we're dealing with some of the smaller independent contractors, and they're mentioning, you know, maybe if they're switching companies and they're going to a different, to work for a different logistics company or, or use their services with a different company, they talk a lot about the manager. So sometimes they don't even mention the company name. They say, I'm going to work for this person who's the manager at a certain location. So I think the manager's relationships with the drivers is really important. We see a lot of drivers, they'll flock together and they'll all go to a certain place. And sometimes it's due to the manager. And a, a lot of times it's it's based on the brand that the of the of either the manager or the company that they work for. And the drivers will tell them, you know, this person's more fair, this person pays well, uh, this per, this manager doesn't send me out on a route mm-hmm. that's they know is going to take 10 hours and, and get mad at me if I can't do it at eight. Uh, those are the type of things that uh, go along with the brand as a whole is, is the importance of the contact that you have with the drivers and some of the understanding that the drivers are talking about it and they are whether it's kind of like their water cooler talk is you know, <laughs> what, what company is offering me something great and which was it actually good and and is this manager treating you right and and are they giving you a bonus or helping you out those are the type of things that they're talking about and so Mm -hmm. it's important that you understand where you fit into that so if they're moving to a different company you know why are they doing it and when they're moving to you what parts of your offering are uh, enticing for them and i think really understanding the way that your brand looks to a driver is important. And sometimes it's hard to pinpoint. We see some companies that um, they're so focused on something that maybe doesn't matter to the drivers. So Mm -hmm. I would say rely on your managers and and have your managers ask the drivers what they, what, what's going on with them, you know, what they're hearing, what, what they care about. And I think that kind of helps uh, helps the brand evolve. Yeah, isn't that interesting? We went full circle from your Aaron's first comment about being driver centric, and then now here we are again. That was well done, gentlemen. We didn't even practice that. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I guess we can all agree then that this is a priority. This should be a priority, keeping the drivers engaged um, to encourage high level, you know, a high level of engagement. These initiatives and. You know, I feel like if the drivers are very well engaged, um, the, then that also leads to better performance. Um, and so everybody wins in, in that case. So thank you. Thank you. That's, that's enough from me. Um, let's hear from the audience. We did have some questions coming in. And as a reminder, everybody, you can use the Q&A button to type your questions and uh, we'll get to them if we, if we can. So let's start with the first question. Um, and this is probably geared towards Yukon. Um, do drivers ever resist? We, we kind of touched on this a little bit. Resist being monitored? Yeah, so you know, obviously part of our solution uh, includes driver monitoring. Um, and with that, um, there, there have been cases where uh, there's uh, concerns about employee resistance. Uh, usually what we advise our clients to do is to uh, put together a proper use policy. So we actually have uh, a policy guideline on our website available to anyone that wants to download it. Uh, 
uh, but it talks about best practices for implementing monitoring technology within organizations. And you know, part of it is going back to what I mentioned earlier is uh, describing uh, what data is collected, uh, how that data is used, um, mm -hmm. how that data uh, should not be used, and um, basically just putting it all out there, being fully transparent. And uh, also focusing on the benefits of the data to the drivers. So how this technology might help them. Um, you know, with our technology, there are a lot of driver uh, oriented benefits. So when companies do that, when they put this policy together, usually it's documented, you know, a lot of times the drivers sign off on it. Usually they have a very successful rollout. Uh, when it's not successful is usually when they roll it out and there's no communication and everyone's just guessing as to what this technology even does, let alone what the data is going to be used for. Um, and then that's when you get, you know, rumors and, and, and things like that uh, within the organization. So that's typically what I see as a best practice when, mm -hmm. when you roll it out. And then again, going back to using the data that's collected to reward people and coach um, people that aren't maybe performing according to or meeting their goals or expectations. Um, you know, usually that's the, the way you would utilize the data to ensure that it's, you know, that, that you don't have as much resistance. Yes, exactly. And Chris kind of touched on something earlier too about how it protects drivers in the event. I mean, if something does go wrong, if they have that monitoring in place, then they're protected. So, you know, that's another, another key point as well. Absolutely. Um, okay, next, let's move on to the next question, unless you guys have anything to add to that. No. Okay, so this is, I think this is for Aaron, um, and I'm, I think this is a great question. Uh, once you find the candidates and they apply or they're in your system, how do you screen them? Yeah, I think uh, we probably have a whole webinar just on <laughs> Okay, we'll do uh, it. Try to keep it at a 30,000 foot level. Okay. Um, we think about the matrix, you know, it's a complex mm -hmm. sort of matrix between yeah our product scheme on one hand that we're delivering and the driver network themselves. As we say at DDI, the product often dictates our driver. You know, are we delivering tacos or are we delivering pharmaceuticals? Because the level of screening and requirements on the driver network is, is going to vary. Right. So what we think about with screening is one, you need the agility and the technology, the technology platform that has the agility really to be able to have that you know, dynamic, especially because many of our customers in these trying times over the last couple of years, even though we're busier, many are, are leaning into the word of pivoting and, mm -hmm. and looking at new products and new schemes. And suddenly automotive clients are delivering food and food clients are delivering marijuana and, and everything in between. And our screening needs for the drivers really, really vary. So you need to have the good tools and that lead to that quick point I made earlier today about then automation, integration, mm -hmm. um, and you can make sure that you're not, if you have the right technology, green lighting a driver for dispatch and saying you're approved without some of those screenings done, mm -hmm. if you've got the right tools. So some of Chris's concerns that he offered earlier today from an insurance perspective, and we hear it at DDI all the time too, oh, well, I needed that driver to get started. You know, if you have good tech, you can get that driver started without having to wait tomorrow morning to come in and approve them type of thing. So a lot to consider there in screening, but it's yeah, yeah, it's an important step though. Okay, next question. Um, I think this is directed at Chris. How can my hiring practices help me save on insurance? And I think you touched on it a little bit, Aaron, but if you have anything to add, Chris. Absolutely. Everybody wants to save on insurance. That's what I get asked all the time. Why, why is my price not going down? Well, I think we all know the main things that uh, insurance companies are looking at is your history, if you've had claims, and also they look pretty closely at your driver pool because typically your drivers, the characteristics are what make it them more or less likely to have a claim. And... Um, we were talking before how you have to be very personable and, and empathetic with your drivers. Unfortunately, on the insurance side, it's all numbers and everybody yeah. looks at, a, at a, a, a driver based on their age, their experience, their driving record, uh, not necessarily what you see, which is, you know, I really want to hire this person. They're a good person and a hard worker. 
but uh, but you know the, the data is what it is. So I would say by keeping those things in mind that you need to screen the drivers, make sure they are fitting what your insurance plan allows, and give looking for drivers that are are going to have a cl cleaner record now and maybe a, a bit older and have experience in the field. I mean those are the ones that are going to help you lower your rates but i know those are the hardest ones to find so it is a it is difficult and that's why we're on this call today is, yeah. is really to try to figure this all out to make it easy easier to hire easier to get drivers in the seats but also um, not have it cause issues like accidents or cause mm -hmm. issues like insurance rates skyrocketing because you know now the only drivers you can find are uh, 17 or 18 years old and you know there's a handful of them that have DUIs or something you know those are things that are, are going to make it super hard to afford the insurance and we know the margins are already pretty low so there's mm -hmm. it's a it's a push and pull and um, you know we we as on on the panel are trying to help out and yeah as best we can yeah here's a question coming in this is a good one um it says, can on the clock safe driver telematic data help employees buy down on their personal insurance? Um, I'm trying to understand that a little bit more. So is on the clock. So when, he's on, when they're on the job and they have a perfect record on the job, does that also translate to their personal driving for you know, a break on the rates and stuff? Um, if they're using their own vehicle and they have mm. and they have uh, tracking and they have dash cameras, that's always going to be helpful on personal insurance if you can show that you're doing that. Um, it really depends on the insurance companies. Most commercial insurance companies are asking all about uh, their safety equipment. Commercial or personal insurance companies haven't quite gotten there to where they have built into their system, you know, a discount for a dash cam, but it's coming. I mean, we all can see it's the future and uh, it's just a matter of time. Mm. Okay. Um, I'll, and, I'll add to that real quick. Too, okay, man. perfect. The yes. thought that we've seen in DDI is the advancement of data tracking, GPS tracking, things mm. like that. It's actually led to we're starting to see, and again, I'm not the insurance, I'm the HR team member on the panel, <laughs> not the insurance guy, you guys <laughs> But um, we're seeing that with the data coming in, that there's different rating formats for products for some of our liability insurance. Instead of like a blanket rate per driver, uh, we're starting to see some liability vehicles out there rated per mile because we now have that data that we could say, oh yeah, well, this is going to be the cost per mile. So instead of a, uh, here's the, the cost for the, the month based on averages to a worker or to cover a worker. Mm -hmm. We're seeing different products starting to pop up out there that are leaning on the data that's newly available in the last few years. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and we, we also see a number of our clients receiving discounts on their insurance premiums yeah. by in, yeah. implementing telematics. So, and I've seen those discounts up to 18%. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, this, this is a broad question, and I think it'd be interesting to hear each of your perspectives. Um, has there ever been any issues surrounding a driver's privacy? Do you, Con, do you want to go first? <laughs> I'll take that first. <laughs> so, um, be so polite. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, with, with, when the company's, when the employee's operating a company vehicle, you know, generally their time in that vehicle is company time. So there's no real expectation of privacy um, when they're operating a company vehicle. So a telematics device that's installed in a company vehicle, they really shouldn't have an expectation of privacy because they're essentially, you know, using that, that, that company asset, mm. you know, on, at, at all times. Um, we do have a solution, uh, a mobile uh, solution where it's used to clock in and clock out throughout the day. They, jobs can be sent to those. So these routes that can be optimized, it can be dispatched to that mobile solution. So with that mobile solution, uh, the drivers have to grant permission to track their locations. So it will not send up locations unless the drivers mm -hmm. basically turn on that setting to allow us to do right. so or the system to do so. Uh, in addition to that, when they're off duty, when they clock out, it doesn't track them. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, it, it finally, you know, it, it basically delineates company time versus personal time. It's right. not going to collect any data from them during personal time, and it only collects data from them during company time. Okay, cool. Yeah. Aaron, you want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, absolutely. So again, the human resources lens uh, on this is I would offer that we have a smarter workforce than ever, a more yeah. educated you know, populace, all of us, right? Are more educated about privacy, data security, and these types of concerns. So the HR lens goes around data sharing and disclosures, but really be prepared and make sure your processes are tight uh, when it comes to, well, I think about the tools first. So be prepared for, you know, questions from applicants, like about your simple, you know, data validated mm -hmm. security keys on your websites, your mobile apps, apps that we're using on mm -hmm. here, how secure is that data exchange on that? And we're getting asked those questions. And the last thing we consider is we get checked all the time because we're trained and certified on it, but on literally the applicants will question us on the background check procedures as a, an example, yeah. right? What is the process to whom are you sharing this yeah, information? Right. Yeah. Uh, is it secure? Is there a, a chain of information security? So it's not getting disclosed along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, now we do things at such high volume at DDI that, you know, you screen a couple hundred thousand people, you're naturally going to get a, you know, a percentage of applicants that come through. But I would, again, push the audience to yeah. maybe kind of do a, an internal sweep of yeah. some of these concerns through your, your recruiting and hiring processes. Yeah, exactly. Chris, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we covered that. That was a great question. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, that's it. I think we're just about out of time. Um, I just want to give a big thanks to our panel. And of course, big thanks to you, the audience, for joining us today. Um, when we send out the link for the webinar, we're also going to include links for DDI, FieldLogix, and SWAN so that you could find out more information. And um, you know, if, the, if you have any further questions, just feel free to let us know. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Tammy. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.